Hello comrades, and welcome to the second Soviet Union focused street dev diary. For those that missed it, last week covered Stalin and his control of the Soviet Union, its government, its military, and its army. This week, however, we'll cover some alternative paths for Marxist-Leninism. So sit down, grab a vodka, and relax as we cover the dev diary. But before we jump into these alternative paths, I will mention that there is going to be another dev diary about the Soviet folk history, covering the alternative paths in the form of democracy and who knows, maybe even a Tsar, but that remains to be seen. So if you're looking forward to that and want to see it on this channel, please feel free to subscribe and like the video. So without further ado, let's see how Trotsky's getting along. So this week we're introduced to a new content designer by the name of Mano Di Zombie, who is currently working on this side of the Soviet focus tree, meaning that it's been designed by multiple different people with different branches being handled by different people. The branches we're going to be covering today are the left opposition, led by Trotsky, and the right opposition, led by Bukharin. So the dev diary begins by setting some of the background information before we begin. Even before Lenin's death, people were battling to take control of the party, Stalin had solidified himself as the centre, the moderates if you will, while denouncing anybody who was outside of his purview as being factionalist, those being the Trotskyists to the left and the Bukhans to the right. The Dev Diary continues with this thought process by dividing up the three communist paths as such. The first one, the centre, was covered last week, so this week we start off with the left. So it's hard to ignore that the left opposition focus, which is the first you take, starts the process towards a civil war. Um, it's an unavoidable fact that if you take the Trotskyist path you are going to have a civil war, similar to how the Spanish Civil War is completely unavoidable. And so that means that the top half of the branch of the left opposition is entirely focused towards that civil war and ensuring that your people don't get purged in the process. So as you can see here, there are quite a few focuses we have to do before we jumpstart ourselves into a civil war with Ignite the Flames at the bottom, but not all of them are guaranteed to be 70 days, so hopefully some of these will be easier than others. So to go over some of the focuses we can see in this branch, the Committee in Exile focus, as seen here, can be used to send supporters abroad. This means that people who Stalin traditionally would have purged can be kept safe for your post-game Trotskyist empire. Saying Trotskyist empire like an oxymoron? Possibly. I don't know. <laughs> Regardless, you can save people and advisors so that you need them after the civil war once you make sure that they can't be purged. Similarly, integrating Smirnov's block has the ability to make sure you hide away free significant political prisoners so that they cannot be exiled and purged in prison. Additionally, there are two focuses that allow you to approach different generals and military officers to make sure they're on your side, one of them being Primakov, which we can see here. There is an optional focus that can be taken down the Trotskyist path to organise the wreckers, who were in the mind of Stalin, the leftist and rightist oppositionaries, who were sabotaging all the factories and, you know, building up to his paranoia. So with this focus, you can actually enact upon such thoughts and begin sabotaging and destroying things so that, once the war begins, Stalin is a little less stronger. And so, once all is said and done, you can take the Ignite the Flames to start the civil war. But before we dive into the civil war, we also have the right side of this tree with Buharin. At this point, it really does feel like the focus tree is following in the footsteps of the Spanish civil war, because both sides also plan around eventually building up to a civil war and sort of planning against an underground state. So Buharin's branch begins by talking about how, as with the leftist branch, one way you can go about taking control is with a coup d'etat, a civil war although it does warn you that the Red Army is Trotsky's Red Army, so you're possibly going to have a much weaker force and it's going to be more difficult to actually win that civil war. In order to try and tip the scale towards your side, one focus you can take is concessions to foreign powers. This allows you to unlock decisions to request aid from foreign powers and hopefully push your side to winning the civil war. They give an example with Vladivostok. As we can see here, for 25 political power, you can offer Vladivostok to Japan, which potentially sticks them on your side should things go south, but also has the downfall of causing Stalin's paranoia to rise. It's important to remember that it's Stalin's paranoia that's currently purging you and your allies. 
And so with that, we've seen Trotsky to the left and we've seen Buchan to the right, but there is also a, let's not say a new branch, but a sort of 2.5 branch, which is called the New Opposition and Common Focuses. So halfway between the left and the right are a series of focuses that can be taken by either side to try and strengthen you up by coming together with factions that are not quite on your side, but perhaps different members of the party. As we can see here, we have the option to gain support from party members to eventually cooperate against Stalin. Cooperation against Stalin allows you to take members that are perhaps not quite on your side, but could swing either way. Of course, this creates a system of factionalism, which means that you don't really have a solidified base of power because, you know, your people are all disagreeing with each other about this, that and the other. Continuing down this, you also have the ability to align the Zinovites? Apologies about pronunciation, which allows you to take two current political prisoners, get them out of prison, and keep them around so they can't be purged. Again, they're not necessarily on your side, but they will be strong enough to justify them being saved. Another two of the shared focuses between the left and the right opposition is deciding whether you want the military support or the NVKD. The military support is quite straightforward. When you're heading into civil war, having the military supporting you means more soldiers more planes, more navy. On the flip side, you can divert attention towards the military and away from the NKVD, which allows you to go for a more covert path, which they suggest is possibly much more useful for the right opposition. And so for the final section about the Soviet civil war, we have the civil war itself, with its own mechanic system, which, keeping in touch with the Spanish civil war, has a similar state allegiance mechanic, where you'll be spending political power and working under various conditions to ensure that once the civil war begins, states will be on your side and not Stalin's. One of the first things you'll have to decide is where to set up your headquarters, and each of the different headquarters come with different abilities and things to consider. What's interesting about this image is we can actually see some of the um, different support you get. It shows you that army support is low, the navy is non-existent, um, very few planes, and there's also popular support which means that the more popular support you get, the easier it's going to be to win the civil war because of surrender limit. Is it too critical of me to say, I don't know why you need to worry too much about Navy support? When is the Navy going to help you in the Russian civil war? Maybe I'm being too negative, but um, something tells me it's not something you need to worry about too much. And so, as we said, once you've established a base, you need to start converting different states to be on your side when the war begins. Here we can see that for 25 political power, you can take up various states in Ukraine. It's worth bearing in mind that it's probably worth getting the states with the better supply because fighting a civil war in Siberia doesn't sound like a good idea, chief. In regards to that military support focus we saw earlier, here are some of the decisions you can get from it. Um, recruiting a general to your cause, which I'm sure just gives you a decent general and the admiral if that is so your desire but most importantly, increasing the support for those different branches, specifically army support, which probably means you get a higher percentage of the troops once things go south. It is, of course, easy to forget that Stalin is not standing by idly while you try to overthrow his rule. So, as you're working through taking these states, building army support, as we saw earlier, there's higher chances of his paranoia growing. And what's happening is he's sort of still doing his focus tree in the form of decisions. This means that the longer you take faffing about getting this, that and the other, he's continuing his purges. And you are on that list of purges to be purged, so the longer you take, the weaker you're also going to get. As we can see here, Stalin is working towards the loyalty of his generals as something he can do, building up his power in the army. He can also build a terrorist centre, which was one of his focuses, which is going to start the Moscow trials. This is not good for you. This is bad. Should you find yourself Stalin hitting 90 paranoia, there is a 20% chance every single day that he's going to outright start the civil war without you. This is really bad because when you pick the focus to start the civil war, you get the buffs for being the aggressor. But if Stalin does it because he's very paranoid, he's going to get the one up over you and you're going to be even weaker. So really balancing and making sure that certain decisions you take don't annoy him too much is very important. So eventually, whether it was you, Stalin, or a fish in the Vietnamese Bay, something has started a civil war. And with that comes a new leader and a new flag. And um, 
yeah, that is definitely a flag. <laughs> that is definitely a flag. I think that's a number four in there, suggesting the fourth revolution. We also get the opportunity to be reminded that the names have changed to the more Russian style, so it's no longer Leon, but Lev. At this point, the dev diary doesn't really divulge too much into how the civil war is going to go, which I find kind of strange because half of the focus trees are about that civil war, but let's just assume it's like a standard civil war, you push one side out and you win. In its stead, the dev diary talks about a different mechanic. Um, originally it was posed that it is like guaranteed that you're going to have a civil war if you oppose Stalin. However, if you pick the right opposition, they suggest there is an alternative path. Let's assassinate Stalin. So as we discussed earlier, you could work with the NKVD to push blame towards the military and have the NKVD on your side, which was particularly good if you're the right opposition. In this, I believe, begins a series of events that allow you to plan to assassinate Stalin. You have to do this quickly though, because Stalin is planning to make Beria his second in command and head of the NKVD. And that is a, uh, that's a monster that's a little bit too difficult to get out of power. So you need to make sure that it's going to be in that crisis point where the NKVD has a very weak leadership. So assassinating Stalin is probably something you want to plan doing very early on. If you succeed in assassinating Stalin and Beria has not become the head of the NKVD, there will be an empty point where there is no proper successor. It is at this point that it is your time to swoop in and take the throne for yourself. On the other hand, there is the possibility that you're going to fail. If that's the case, then Stalin lives and his paranoia about being assassinated is, uh, well, it's, it's real. You did try to assassinate him and that's going to send up the paranoia straight to the top and possibly start a civil war instantly without you sort of being prepared for the civil war at all. Well, good luck with that war, I suppose. <laughs> so at this point, we reach the second half of the focus trees, which is the post-civil war branches. So once you've won your civil war, you've kind of got to start looking outwards. You've got Germany planning to attack you. You've got Democrats who want to usurp you. Things possibly aren't the best. So we begin by looking at what Trotsky's going to do post-war. So we start off by being reminded that the focus is to do with um, foreign powers, the common turn, um, the industry and military stuff. Most of those should all still be available if you choose to go down them. But there are some focuses that of course are unique to Trotsky himself. So as we can see here, there are 21 focuses that you can take post Civil War for Trotsky. Um, some of them are mutually exclusive, but that's them in total. So on the left, we have the sub branch for the permanent revolution which I believe had its place in the original Soviet focus tree, but I think it was just like one or two focuses. In this, you can begin Trotsky's dream of a permanent revolution, where every country across the globe can begin its own personal class struggle. The permanent revolution gives Trotsky an individual buff, um, giving him subversive activities cost reduction, the ability to stop ideology drift, um, just some very small but still decent buffs all round, as well as unlocking the organized fifth columnist decisions. These decisions will begin planting the seeds in different countries of civil wars which you can usurp within them. As either the left or the right opposition, you of course have to deal with the original um, moderates, the sort of ones who weren't quite on your side. Um, you can remove them, you can just get rid of them outright, but interestingly there is a center focus called Return Democracy to the Party where the factionalist people who weren't quite on your side can be sort of allowed to stay. We also have the Builder of the Red Army focus, which simply is described as allowing Trotsky to become a field force commander. And then finally, at the bottom, we have three choices that you can get for the very, very end of the focus branches. The first one is how you choose to deal with the end of the Soviet Union. Do you want to decentralize it? Which would mean taking all of the states within you. We're talking Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and giving them more autonomy to create the International Union of Soviet Republics. I'm thinking this is kind of what was being headed towards in the later years of the Soviet Union to ensure they had uh, much more power in things like the United Nations. An alternative branch you can go for, which can be taken by both the left and the right opposition, is by strengthening the trade unions you can get the People's Revolution. This is about removing the ideas of, um, you know, Stalinism or Trotskyism or whatever it needs to be 
and just focusing on the party itself with the Supreme Soviet. I personally think this one is very cool because here we can see there is no like central leader. Everybody has a good amount of uh, control. It raises stability. It gives you good compliance gain, which means that all of those areas you've got under your control as you maybe do a little bit of annexing, come into the Soviet Union easier. And then there is the right option, which can only be taken by the right opposition. Um, so let's go through the right opposition and see what they can do at the end of their civil war. So for the most part, it looks like it's mostly based on economy, industry, and just building up a very strong base. The back to the NEP branch is very much so focused on industry. Here we can see a sustainable economy gives you a new economic policy, giving you consumer good buffs, um, more factories in a state. I mean, I don't know why the Soviets need more building slots, but you can have them if you want them. You also get the ability to upgrade your trade unions and labor organizing by making Mikhail Tomsky uh, become much better at production efficiency and just building up as many guns as you can. So we hopefully don't get a repeat of Stalingrad. Although actually, now that I think about it, would it even be called Stalingrad anymore? Would it be called like Brezhnevgrad or Trotskygrad or something? As you work down, you'll eventually get to the enemies of the people, which simply put gives you uh, puppet war goals against nations around you that do not follow your ideology. And finally, 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 we reach the very end of the right branch too, which shares the Supreme Soviet path we talked about earlier, where there is no great leader and it's just the party itself, but you also have for the common good subpath. This is about finally solidifying your country under socialist humanism, which allows you to get an extra research slot and recruitable population. It certainly feels like, in my opinion, that going down the right opposition is a lot more difficult for the civil war, but in terms of like later on when Germany's invading you, I think you'd much rather have the right opposition with their factory buffs, their construction buffs, their military buffs. It just seems stronger. And with that, that covers the additional focuses coming for the communist alt history branches. Um, yeah. I think they're good. I do think they're good. However, I'm surprised at how much of it is focused on that civil war, which really does give me flashbacks to the Spanish civil war focus tree. And then beyond that, I guess you're focusing on the other focuses you can do instead of that. So I guess it's not too bad all round because you don't want to be stuck in a political branch the entire game. With that, the dev diary talks about some of the leaders you can get before the end um, with all of their abilities to show. So let's just run them across. Of course, we have Trotsky here with his name change and triumphant revolutionary perk. We have Spurnov, which um, is called the Siberian Lenin, which I thought was quite funny. He gives you an operative slot, which I thought was interesting. I wonder if this ability is going to carry any weight if you don't have the resistance, or does the spy mechanic come with this DLC maybe? It's one of those awkward things where the DLC policy can kind of make it confusing if you're going to get something or not. So maybe it works. Here we can see Nikolai Bukharin, defender of the peasantry, and eventually hero of the peasantry. That's a, that's a good amount of political power gain. I'm a fan of that and the research speed too. We've got Rykov as a potential leader, which gives you some army experience game and some consumer goods factories. Here we have Kamenev, the faded star, who I think is probably weaker than he looks, but I think he has the best portrait. So. Maybe I'm just biased towards a good moustache and beard. Next up, we have the born agitator with the uh, with the crazy hair, uh, looking very stern, but possibly one of the best. I'm tempted to say he's one of the best leaders. Political power gain, recruitable population factor, and recovery rate. I mean, division recovery rate in Russia is definitely something to uh, to look out for. And finally, as we saw earlier, the Supreme Soviet with their Great buffs to stability, nothing wrong with them, true, strong party discipline. And so yeah, that sums up everything in this dev diary. They do give us two, I don't know if you want to call them teasers or Easter eggs, but the top one appears to be some kind of state rework, I'm tempted to say, or some workaround with a state shape, as well as two different flags. Um, the flags, I'm going to be honest, I am not sure what they are but they do give me like Kazakhstani, Turkmenistan vibes. And with that, that's the dev diary. So I felt it was shorter than last week, thank goodness, 
um, but it did cover the stuff we wanted to know. Let me know what you think and I'll say thank you very much for watching. I'm very much so looking forward to next week's Dev Diary. Come on SARS! And with that, if you've liked, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!